Amen. And as you're finding your seat, I want to invite you to take your Bibles and open them up to Matthew chapter number 28. Matthew chapter number 28. And we're going to be going right to the very end of this book of the Bible, Matthew chapter number 28. Most of you know, but some of you don't know, that in addition to leading this wonderful church, um, God has used me over the last nearly 12 years now to lead mission trips full of people um, from all over the country to go all over the world. Um, We have been to China more than 30 times. We have been into India dozens of times. Uh, We've been all over the Caribbean, into Jamaica, probably 20, 25 times. Uh, We've been to Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, We're looking at going into the nation of Colombia in South America, maybe next year. Um, God continues to open up doors of opportunity um, to go and share the good news of Jesus Christ to a lost world. I got a message even yet this morning um, from someone that I made you aware of a few weeks ago in Burundi, Africa. You may not know this, but there is a Water's Edge church in Burundi, Africa right now today. Uh, It's an amazing thing. Um, This young pastor contacted me and said, you know, we've we've been following you online. We watch your videos on YouTube every week, our church. Now, their church has grown now to over 200 plus people. People, yeah, praise the Lord for that. Um, Even yet this morning, now they are about seven hours ahead of us, so it's coming up on nighttime now. But this morning in their services, they baptized seven new believers. Isn't that wonderful what God does? I mean, all over the world, uh, my ministry partner, Pastor Jacob in India, baptized three people that converted from the Hindu religion to Christianity through the midst of this pandemic. Um, Our organization has been sending literally flatbed trailers full of fruits and vegetables. Um, Just recently, we sent over 320 pounds of rice into the villages where we work, and the people are getting food and nutrition and medicine and toiletry items that are becoming a scarcity. Um, They're not allowed to go out to the stores. They don't have the exception clause like we did, like stay indoors. Well, you can go to Walmart, you can go to gas stations, you can go here, you can go there. When they lock down, it is locked down. So we've had, our organization has had to make arrangements with the local police in order to get police approval to open a grocery store and buy the needed things and then get police escorts into the villages. It's really been a logistical nightmare, and yet the fruit of that is that when you meet basic human needs that people have, food, water, clothing, toiletry items, things like that, it softens their heart because it's not the people from all these other religions that are reaching out with these items, it is the only Christian church in the region that's doing that work. They are the ones, with the help of our ministry, they are the ones that are taking and transporting food that will feed in upwards of a thousand people. It's been an amazing thing, and it continues to be an amazing journey. Um, You may also not know this, but in that little village in India, a village called Kambalapalam, that's a handful, it's about that long to write, But within that city, we operate an orphanage there. We have 25 children in our orphanage right now. And we are providing everything for them. Food, water, shelter, medical, school clothes, school equipment, um, notebooks, pencils, paper, everything that they need in order to to survive and exist in a, a, a meaningful, decent way. Um, Our organization is providing 100% of that for them. It's an amazing thing that God has done 
over the years of us partnering with them. I really consider them to be kind of like my surrogate children in a way. When I go there, it's like I have this flock of kids all around me. Everybody wants a finger to hold on to while we walk. And I usually walk everywhere kind of like this, everywhere I go, because there's just a, a flood of kids that just love to be with our groups when we go. Um, it's been heartbreaking to get reports of some of them that have gotten the COVID virus and they're young and healthy otherwise and they're surviving it no problem at all. Uh, but we've also had some of our helpers, um, one lady in particular, her English name is Rebecca. She and her husband Isaac have been instrumental in helping us over the years as we go back into the same village to work. Um, Rebecca has cleaned for us. She has cooked for us. She's done everything we need. Rebecca and Isaac are always there. Well, Rebecca got COVID and was hospitalized after several weeks of being really sick. The breathing issues started. Their local hospital said, we don't have any oxygen available. We're out and we have no, no, no more is coming. So our organization arranged to put her into a private hospital outside about 90 kilometers away from the village. And we, God provided a way for us to provide 100% of her medical cost, including five very expensive treatments um, for the most advanced cases of COVID. And I was just two days ago able to get a video call from Pastor Jacob, and lo and behold, there was Rebecca and her smiling face. God is great. God is so good to us. And, that you know, I, it has taught me a great lesson on reliance upon the Lord. Because when, when people call, and we get calls all the time from, from people we work with all over the world. And, our, you know, Deacon so-and-so's house burnt down. Pastor so-and-so's house was demolished through a, some event or some pastor. You know, right now in the general region where we work in India, 392 pastors have lost their life to COVID. 392 pastors. That's heartbreaking. These are people that I've sat in conferences with that have come up and just hugged on me and loved on our group and, and just they're so eager to learn and to grow and, and things like that. And these people work in desolate places in the deep forested areas of India. They have nothing. They have no income. They All they have is a Bible that we provided for them. And they go out and they just faithfully preach the Word of God every Every single day of the week, one of them contacted us through Pastor Jacob a year and a half ago, and he said, we need a sound system. And I said, well, brother, you don't even have a, a church building. He said, it doesn't matter. We need a sound system because we made a tent over here. And so I, I talked to him a little bit, and we agreed, and we spent several hundred dollars to buy a small amplifier and a, one of those large cone things. They needed two of those, and then a little speaker like small, half the size of this for inside this big tent. Well, lo and behold, the reason for that was that this village has about 400 people that live in these little makeshift tents made of tarpoleums, and, and they, they just live like that, and they, they just, whatever you can grow or whatever is what you eat. Well, he had the idea that these people, I can't make them come to hear me at the church, at my tent. So he set up this sound system so every single day of the week when he's preaching the Word of God, he puts it over this, these big PA speakers so the entire village hears the gospel of Jesus Christ. I love creative people like that. I love working with people. Those are the people you love to partner with. And you love to see the fruit of that as people are going about their day-to-day -day lives and they're hearing the word of God and they're hearing the gospel of Jesus and their lives are being transformed. That brings us to Matthew chapter number 28. I want you to drop down to verse number, go to verse number, I told our guys verse 18. Let's go back to verse number 16. 
Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountains which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, what a joy it is to go and see these final words spoken by your mouth to your followers, that we have a commission that is so great that it literally encompasses the entire world upon which we live. God, give us ears to hear this great word today. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Before the ascension of Jesus Christ back into heaven, he gave his followers what we commonly refer to as the Great Commission. And it is great. It's overwhelming to think that he's given the church, not just in America, but the church all over the world, the church worldwide, he has given us marching orders to reach every person, every language group, every cluster of people living on the planet with the gospel of Jesus Christ to take the good news to them. You know, this flies in the face of, of the model that we have adopted in the church today that Water's Edge is going to be, begin changing again like we were before the pandemic. We have never been a church of y'all come. We have tried diligently to be a church of get out there and find them. Go out, take the church out to the neighborhoods, knock on doors, put hangers on the doors, reach the people that are unreached, reach the people that everyone else has forgotten about. We are a church of imperfect people serving a perfect God. All, everyone here, we're all imperfect. We all bring our flaws and our failures and our ineptitudes. We bring that with us to church, but we serve a God who is perfect, who will love anybody that will come and give their life to him. That's a wonderful truth, and it is, makes us unique from all the rest of the religions around the world in which we live. I hope that we're going to be able to partner with our local association of churches, the Green Valley Association. Um, we're going to get in on a program. I just had lunch with Brother Bill, our, our director of missions. He's been a friend of mine for nearly 25 years, one of my best friends. And Bill and I got together, and he was telling me about this program. And I said, Bill, you know, right before the pandemic hit, Water's Edge Church made a commitment to knock on the door of every household in the city of Henderson over a five-year period. Every single door, every household in the city of Henderson would get a knock on it by a member of Water's Edge Church. And we started great. We had big, big neighborhoods of people. You remember those days? It was about 150 degrees. Mark remembers. He about collapsed one day. I mean, it was well over 100 degrees, baking sun, and we were out there just going house by house by house through neighborhoods all over back by County High School. And we just went out there just hanging hanging things on their doorknobs, knock on the door, introduce ourselves, invite them to church. We're going to be getting back to that. You know, we've, we've been very cautious, and I think appropriately so, during this pandemic. But you know, there's nothing that says that we can't take a bag and hang it on someone's doorknob and invite them to come to our church. Now, included in that bag is going to be a CD um, that gives a great, clear gospel message. It's going to include some other information, and it'll include a flyer about Water's Edge Church, inviting them to come and be part of what God is doing right here on Watson Lane. So I'm looking forward to that, but I, I can't do this alone. We're going to need your help. We're going to need people. Listen, you might not be able to walk all through the neighborhood, but you can certainly go across the street, right? Nod your head this way. You can go across the street. Don't try to tell me you can't. Anybody can go across the street. 
and you can knock on a door or you can just hang a bag on their door and pray right there. God, let them get this. Let it just minister them where they are right now. We can all be part of this and we can all have a hand in this. So I look forward to doing that. And as soon as I get back from vacation, we're going to be rolling this out again as we move into the fall because I'm excited about what God is doing in and through the life of Water's Edge Church. And this city needs to hear about it. This city needs to know what's going on here. The city needs to understand that there is a place where they can serve Jesus and have a kingdom impact on the lives of people that live all around us in this city. So stay tuned for more about that. And the, listen, the reason we do that is not to blow our own horn. The reason we do that is not to shine the light on how great we are. We're not great. We're just regular people serving a great God. But we do it because Jesus commanded us to do it. He, he did. We don't call this the great opportunity. We don't call it the great option plan A. We call it the great commission. The commission is an order. King Jesus has said, get out there, go into every city, every village, every neighborhood, every language group, take the message, take the good news to them. We take that seriously, and we're going to get back after it very, very soon, moving into fall. Now, we're going to encapsulate those outreach events with some events right here at church. We're going to have a big church picnic that's going to be open to the whole community. We're going to invite everybody to come and just have fun with us, have a campfire out here, have some booths out here, have some fun things for the kids to do. We're going to roll it all out in big fashion like only Water's Edge Church can. It's going to be an exciting thing to see and watch what God does with that. I can't wait to get the horse trough out again and start baptizing people. <laughs> I can't wait for that. I mean, there's something magical about that dumb steel tank. Uh, you know, when we, we're, we're going to start, we've got a lot of people that are waiting right now for baptism, and we're going to get it out real soon. And then as we start seeing people come and more and more come and people give their lives to Christ, there's going to be a momentum that builds. And we're going to, I, I hope that we are counted in the same number as those followers of Jesus were counted in, when you re look at and read Acts chapter number 17 and verse number 6, the political leaders of the day said those people, those, those Christians, he called them those people, are turning their world upside down. Oh, I would to God that that would be said about Water's Edge Church. That Water's Edge Church is just turning Henderson upside down. That it is a movement of God that cannot be explained by our own personal effort. But that it is something that only God is doing. When I, I had lunch with Bill, we talked about this. And I mean, we, we just, I mean, we shared for probably close to two hours with one another because our hearts are one with the gospel. I mean, he and I are like birds of the same feather. And as we were talking, about this, he said, I have been heartbroken that there is no Southern Baptist church that has legitimately embraced this call to reach every single home in Henderson. He said, if you all can pull that off, you will stand alone as a shining star for Jesus in this city. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't it be wonderful to be known by that? When someone comes and knocks, oh, good grief, it's Water's Edge Church again. <laughs> I mean, I, I just love that. I would love to feel those phone calls here at the church. Would you guys please stop knocking on my door? And, and my response is, well, if you come and join, we'll stop knocking. I mean, that's what we need to be. That's, the pe that's who we are. That's our DNA as a church to go out and embrace a lost world and be that church full of imperfect people serving a perfect God. You know, if ever we have lived in a time when our world is upside down, it's today. I, plain and simple, that's no great revelation for you. You know that. If you just watch any news at all, or even if you just go out into the world, our world is upside down today. It's crazy. It's lost its mind. I mean, this world, everything that used to be 
considered kind of sacred is now secular. Everything that used to just be wonderful is now kind of seen as backward. I mean, it's a strange world in which we live today. Instead of the church turning the world upside down, um, a small microscopic virus has done that. Isn't that odd? That something microscopic can turn the whole world upside down, but a world filled with hundreds of millions of Christians could not seem to get the job done? That's an indictment on all of us, including me. As much as I go, I live with the understanding that I could go more, I could do more, I could reach more people, I could share the gospel more faithfully at every given opportunity. You know, I never want to be the guy that distracts people while they're working or something like that. But you know what? When we were sitting at a restaurant where we were having our lunch the other day, we just asked the server, said, we're getting ready to have prayer right now before we eat. Is there anything we can pray for you about? And you know, sometimes, I mean, people are like, "Uh, not really. You know, I got a drink order over here I got to fill. And you know, it's just a little awkward. This young lady, she didn't hesitate. She said, pray for my family. My mom and dad are in Mexico still, and things are not good where they live. Please pray for them. Pray for my sons. They're going to be going back to school. Pray for me because I'm getting ready to start a second job as soon as they go back to school. Boom, boom, boom. You never know what someone is going through until you ask them, right? A server at a restaurant would never just come up and say, hey, if you're going to pray over your meatloaf, could I give you a list? Nobody would ever, I wouldn't do that. Nobody would ever do that. If you ask, now I don't, I don't mean you leave a dumb Bible track instead of a tip. I hope you've never done that. If you have, shame on you. Don't ever do it again. Leave a good tip. You're a representative of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Act like it. But when you go, ask them. We're just going to have a quick prayer. Can we pray? Is there anything at all we can pray for you about? Takes just a second. It's not awkward. It doesn't put them on a defensive. You're not trying to take 10 minutes of their time while other people are getting mad at them. We're going to pray. Can we pray for you? And then just sit back and see what the Lord does. They may say no. Say, okay. Then you still pray for them. You still pray for them. And ask God to do something in their lives. That's what our church needs to get back to. we got to get back to the bare knuckles of the gospel. We've got to get back to being a gospel-centric people in a lost, dark, and dying world. That's who we are as a church, and that's who we need to be once again. Our orders are to go into the world and tell them the glorious news of a crucified and risen Savior who specializes in saving souls and changing lives. The first point, this is so easy, our mission is to get out there and go. That's our, that's our mission, to go. Not sit here and wait for them to come, but to go. To get out there, take the good news wherever we go. The mandate of the Great Commission is the very first words, go therefore and make disciples. It's interesting the play on words right there in the original language. There is an assumptive clause there. The words there in the original language, go therefore and make disciples, that literally in the, in the original Greek language says, as you go, make disciples. As you go, there's an assumption there that God's people are always on the go. We're always on the go out there telling people about Jesus. And it says, as you go, make disciples. Tell people the glorious truths of Jesus and give them an opportunity to come to know him as Lord and Savior. You know, it goes without saying that we cannot go if we are content to simply sit still. We can never be a complacent church. 
We can never allow the, the sin of complacency to infiltrate into the life of our church. We have to be that group of people. We have to be those people that will go to the ends of the earth. Yeah, I don't know how God is going to use you, but I can tell you this, 20 years ago, I never in my wildest dreams would have ever dreamed that God would take me to the heart of communist, communism, into the capital of the largest communist nation in the world to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, as, as God is, as I was going through this, I was going back through our ministry page of Culture Waves Global, and I was going back through that, and I found a picture and a little story. There was a young lady, I was sitting in a park right across the street from my hotel that I stay at in Beijing. It is part of the ancient, they call it the Ming Wall. It was a wall that surrounded the old part of Beijing. There's only a, a section of it left that's about a mile long. And they built this beautiful park around it. And I was in the park, and I was just sitting on one of the benches. I had been out walking that morning. And I was sitting there, and two young girls came up, and they said, where are you from? And I, I said, I'm American. They said, wow, so you're a missionary. That's a big red flag in, in my world because, you know, people are out there looking. They think every American is a missionary. They think that we all come in with this covert plan to convert the nation, which we do in all fairness, but we never assume that they think that. Well, come to find out, one of the young ladies was already a Christian and went to the, a university in the United States in um, the upper New Hampshire area. The other one was her friend that was an English student at the university in Beijing. So they said, they stand there and they're talking to me. And so I, I was I'm shocked. I've never met a Chinese person anywhere in the country that claims to be a Christian. And I've been there a number of times, never met one. This girl says, well, I'm a, I'm a Christian, I'm a believer, I go to this church, and it's a church that I've taken our groups to for 12 years. Every Sunday we're in Beijing, we go to the Chongwen Men Christian Church, and we sit there with our earphones on, and I listen to um, one of the young ladies who works for me now um, translate the service into English. I look at the other girl, and I said, why with such a great friend, why haven't you become a Christian yet? She said, I don't know how. I said, may I tell you how? And both of them stood right there in the middle of a park less than two miles away from Tiananmen Square, the hub of the Communist Party in China. And I stood there, and in the simplest terms that God would give me the ability, I shared the gospel with her, and right there next to the Ming Wall in Beijing, that young lady prayed and gave her heart to Christ. You just can't make that stuff up. You, you know, it, it's surreal. I just, I truly believe with all of my heart that there are some appointments in the course of our life that are divine appointments. That God puts you here, God brings them here, and through the grace of God, you have a convergence there, a divine appointment where God brings you to a get together for an appointed task. And that day, that young lady was gloriously saved by Jesus. It was the very last day of my trip. In fact, as I was praying with her, in the back of my mind, I was thinking I might be late for my flight <laughs> because I had planned to just go to the park and sit there and drink my coffee and then go back to my hotel, gather my things, and get to the airport. God is so good. I truly believe that if it went another half hour, God would have broke the plane until I got there. I really believe that. I, I truly believe it. God is good. You know, I've said this so many times before, but I beg saying again, God is not looking for the smartest people. God is not looking for the most um, eloquent speakers. 
God is not looking for the bold-spirited people. The greatest ability that you can have as a follower of Jesus is availability. If you are available, I'm telling you, God will send people your way. God will place people in your path that you can be a blessing to and maybe even lead to Jesus. It's the glorious truth of the gospel that God says go, but as we go, God has a plan. God's plan is for us to go, and as we go across the street and down the road and into the neighborhoods around us and then spilling out into the city of Henderson, God is already working on the hearts of men and women and boys and girls out there before we ever get there. They're ready to be saved. They're ready to give their lives to Christ. But we have to go. God will use us. Our mission, our mission and mandate is to go. Next, I want you to see our message. Our message is completely gospel-centered. Everything we do revolves around the gospel. In verse 20, look at that with me again. Teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus tells his followers to share a specific message with them. To observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So as we go and we tell the world about Jesus, the message that we are to share is crystal clear. We are to share the gospel, the good news of a crucified and risen Savior that will save anybody that will call on him. That's it. Our message is not a message about Water's Edge Church. I love Water's Edge Church. But our message isn't about Water's Edge Church. It's not about the pastor. It's not about the music. It's not about the building. It's not about the property. It's not about any of that. The message is the gospel. This building won't save anyone's life. The gospel of Jesus will never fail. We go out and we share the message of Jesus. We share the good news of our risen Savior with anyone that will listen. Our message is a message of hope to a hurting world. It is literally life in the midst of death. It is healing for the sick. It is the peace of God that surpasses all understanding. It is the message of the, of the gospel. And according to Romans chapter 1, verse 16, it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and then also to the Greek. That's us. The gospel is for everyone. It's no holds barred. Anyone that will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Our message is this, according to 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, verses 3 and 4, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures. That's the gospel. Jesus lived, Jesus died for our sins, God raised him from the dead. That is the gospel. And if people believe that, they can be saved for all eternity. The way they will hear that is by you. By you. Each and every one of us just being available to someone that is hurting and someone that is lost. The most powerful message ever heard, and it is a message that must be delivered to the lost world by the people of God, by you and by me. That's how it works. That's how it's always worked from the very beginning. Remember how hard the people had it back then? Jesus told them, he said, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. The gospel message is powerful, but the thing that gives it power in Christ is when the people of God take it seriously and carry it out into a lost world. You and I have a tremendous job 
ahead of us. Sometimes people are curious and sometimes they're overwhelmed when I say things like this. When I talk about reaching the whole city, they think, how in the world can we do this? How in the world can our small church of people, how can we reach the entire city of Henderson? How can we reach every door? Well, friends, your postman does it every day. The U.S. Postal Service, every single day, rain, sleet, snow, or shine, they visit every single household in the city of Henderson and beyond. May I suggest to you, I know that they have more employees than we have church members, but may I suggest to you if they can do it five days a week, we can do it six days a week, then we can do it once in five years. Amen? I am crazy enough to believe that over the course of the next five years that our church can literally physically knock on every door in the city of Henderson. I really believe that. You can't convince me otherwise. If we're committed. Now, if three of us show up to go out, then three of us will go out. But three people might not be able to do it in five years. We need everybody on board. And listen, you know what the beauty of this is? And I think what's so beautiful when you see this is that families can go out and do this. Mom and dad, kids can trail along. Okay, kids, go up here, hang us on the door. Remember, we're doing this for Jesus. Go put this on their door. Remember, we're doing this for Jesus. What a great thing it teaches little boys and girls from a young age that serving Jesus can be something fun to do, not drudgery. It can be something fun to do. It instills in their hearts and lives that serving the Lord is something they are able to do. They can do it. And I just wonder how many of them God will take those experiences that are planted into their hearts and lives at a young age and how many of them God will call up to go to some God-forsaken place on planet earth where they've never once heard the name of Jesus. You know, there is no place that is out of reach of the modern church. There's no country that is out of our reach. I spoke with a young person yesterday on Facebook. They're part of a small Christian community in the country of Pakistan. This is a pastor, wife, daughter, and they are living in this little lake of believers in a community surrounded by an ocean of Muslims. Their Christian community dates back to the Apostle Paul. Imagine that. Dates back to the Apostle Paul himself coming into the region, into the area, and his his followers going out into those areas uh, around, all around um, Southeast Asia where he was. They're a Christian community that is persecuted constantly. They become successful. They build a church building. The Muslims get up in arms after a time. They burn it to the ground. They, They set up a cross on a building. They knock the building down. But they persist. They keep on going in spite of of hard times, in spite of heartaches, in spite of persecution. They still tell everyone the good news of Jesus Christ. They care for widows. They care for orphans. By the way, do you know what the average annual income? Let Let me back up. One bag roughly translated to about a 60-pound bag of rice, cost about a a little less than a dollar a pound. So about $58 is what you pay for a big 60-pound bag of rice in Pakistan today. You can Google that when you go home. It's about $58, give or take a couple bucks. You know what the annual average income is? 
in the nation of Pakistan right now? Just over 400 U.S. dollars per year. 58 dollars for a bag of rice on a 400 dollar a year income. Now I'm, I wasn't the best at, at math when I was in school, but that's pretty simple for me to understand. It doesn't go very far. We're looking at developing some partnerships and maybe someday in the near future making a trip into Pakistan to go and encourage the believers there and let them know they're not alone, that there are churches and Christians in America that are deeply committed to the cause of Christ and we are eager to hear the reports of, of people coming to know Jesus in a country that is 99% Muslim. I'm looking forward to that. A little bit fearful. A, little, a lot concerned. I, I'm not wired that way. I don't put myself knowingly in harm's way. I don't do that if I can avoid it. Passages like this haunt me. It, there are very few straightforward commands that Jesus gave to us. Go ye therefore and teach all nations is one of them. And it's such a big one that we call it the Great Commission. The Supreme Commission, the largest of the gang. Go, tell them the good news. I'm looking forward to it. I am, I'm looking forward to it. I can't imagine what it'll be like. I, I know the situation they're living in. I know the conditions that our group will face when they go in and how careful we have to be and how concerned and alert we have to be every minute of the day. The gospel is worth it. Their souls are of infinite value to Jesus. And he's given us a commission to go. You'll hear more about that in the, the, the months to come. About how Water's Edge Church might be able to participate in that on some level. It may be God calls up some of you to go, maybe not to Pakistan. Maybe you'll go with me to China, maybe India, maybe Jamaica, maybe across the street. I don't know, but wherever God leads you, I want you to remember that your greatest ability is availability. Say, yes, Lord. I can't do any of this, but yes, Lord, I'll try. Yes, Lord. Our message is gospel-centered. And I've already hit this a little bit, but our mission, our mission is global in scale. We have a worldwide mission ahead of us. Verse number 19, he says, go and teach all nations. In the original language, it says reach every ethnic group. Every ethnic group. Thai ethnos. Every ethnic group of people. Would it surprise you to know that there are people from more than 50 countries around the world that live right here in Henderson, Kentucky? Would that surprise you? Do you know there's people from more than 100 countries around the world that live in Evansville, Indiana? I can remember as a kid, we had one Mexican restaurant and a McDonald's in Evansville. <laughs> that was it. We had nothing. We didn't have restaurants. Nobody went out to eat like we do today. But do you know that today you could pick in nearly any country on the planet and throw a dart at it and you can find a restaurant in Evansville serving their food? There's restaurants from Thailand, Vietnam, China, India. Um, there, there's a Himalayan restaurant of all places. There's a Himalayan restaurant with people that are Himalayan that, that own the restaurant. There are people from Syria. There are people from Iraq. There are people from Iran. There are people from all over the world that the world has come to us. 
We need to engage them with the gospel of Jesus Christ, not just go and enjoy their food. We need to be praying for them, reaching them, talking to them about Jesus, letting them know the hope. Christianity is what made America great. We are the city on a hill. We are the bright, shining light in a dark world. And it's not because of our political structure. It's certainly not because of failed political leaders. It is because we are a Christian nation founded on Christian precepts. We had Christian people that wrote our Declaration of Independence. We had Christian people that founded our nation. We are founded on squarely the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as long as we continue to serve Jesus and be that light shining in the darkness, God will preserve our nation. If we waver, if we fail, if we falter, God can simply raise up another nation that will. That's how it works in God's economy. Aren't you glad that God just didn't leave us out there on our own? Listen to what Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says. It says, but you you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Jesus said, you're not out there on your own. You've got the power of God. You have the power of the Holy Spirit living in you. You can go anywhere. You can do anything. There is no place the modern church cannot reach. I remember sitting at the Southern Baptist Convention years ago, maybe more than a decade ago, The then president of the International Mission Board was a a godly man by the name of Dr. Jerry Rankin. You may remember that name. He was the president of the IMB for many years. He stood up at the, I believe it was at the Southern Baptist Convention, and he said this. He said, we can literally go anywhere in the world. If God has put it on your heart to go somewhere, I want to encourage you to go. And he said this, you can go and preach the gospel on in any country on planet earth as long as you have no expectation of ever coming home let me say that again you can go and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ inside of any country, anywhere on planet earth, as long as you have no expectation of coming home. That was like a dagger in my heart. I thought how pitiful it is that so many of us just sit here so safe and sound while Christian brothers and sisters are being beheaded only because of their faith in Jesus. Now, I'm not saying that you need to go out and, again, put yourself in harm's way knowingly, but I'm telling you there is no place that you can go. There's no place that's off limits to you to go and share the gospel of Jesus Christ so long as you have no expectation of ever coming home. But I want you to know, Jesus is worth it. The gospel is worth it. Making Jesus known to souls that are of infinite value to our Heavenly Father is worth the cost. We have a mandate to go. We're not alone. Our mission is global in scale. But you know, it's a blessing to know, if you look at verse number 21, that we are not alone. Not only are we empowered by the Holy Spirit of God as we go, but if you look at this in verse number 20, it says, I, Jesus, 
Jesus says, I, red letters in your Bible, Jesus himself is speaking these words. I am with you always. Not most of the time, not until harm's way, not until you get into trouble. I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Jesus is always with you. You're never alone when you're serving him. You're never alone when you're out there on a mission field. You are never alone. He's always with you. He does not send us into the world, this lost world, without the capacity to reach people. He doesn't expect us to accomplish this on our own power. In fact, these verses tell us about the resources we have in Christ to reach a lost and hurting world. Not the least of which is his power. His words. He's promised, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'm always with you, even unto the end of the age. I'll, I'm always there. I have been amazed at the number of times that God, me, and Google have been able to share the gospel with people that I can't understand. It's really an amazing thing. Technology has come so far. Do you know right now, they make earbuds, Bluetooth earbuds, that have translators built into them, that if Becky only spoke Russian and I only speak English, she could put a pair of these in, I could put a pair in, and as I talk to her in English, the earbuds would translate my words into Russian for her. Instant, instantly, instantaneously, as I talk to her, I'm speaking in English. She's hearing me in Russian. When she responds in Russian, mine translate instantly into English. Technology has changed everything that we do. I mean, it used to be that if you went as a missionary into a foreign land, you either had to hire somebody that knew your language or you had to devote a year of your life to having someone teach you the language. And then after a year of intensive study, you would then go out and be able to begin sharing Christ with them. It was an arduous process, but thank God we had pioneers like Lottie Moon and Adoniram Judson that went out into the world and they, they did just that. Here's little Lottie Moon, a woman this big, by herself, went into China, spent years learning the language, devoted her entire life to the gospel and reaching people who was accredited for saying this. If I had a thousand lives to give, I'd give them all to China. What a heart. What a heart to reach a group of people with the precious gospel of Jesus. You're never alone. If you go down the street out here putting flyers on doors, you're not alone. Jesus is with you. If you go across the street, and just invite our neighbors that that literally get up every morning and see the church. If you go invite them to church, you're not alone. Jesus is with you every step of the way. You have the power of the Holy Spirit, the Son of God right there beside you. I'm telling you, you can do anything.